Hello again, my friends. Before I get started this morning, I guess I should warn everybody just a little bit. I have uh, several grandchildren down again this weekend, four to be exact, and uh, three of them are the of the uh, smaller variety, <laughs> including young Rachel, who's four years old, who's asleep in the room here. So I thought I would let you know that it's uh, possible there could be grandchild eruptions this morning on the show. So just a heads up. <laughs> a friendly warning, so to speak. My friends, how do we commune and walk with God? According to Romans, we do this spirit to spirit. The scriptures throughout testify to this as far back as we can go, all the way, all the way to the garden. We have a body. We have a soul and we have a spirit. This is how God created us. So when we go, when we go back to the garden and we look and see in Adam and Eve, the eyes of the spirit were opened while they were in the garden. We can see this because they were in full fellowship with Almighty God. And their natural eyes were open because they could see the world around them, the flora, the fauna, and most importantly, eventually, the fruit they so admired on the tree. The eyes that were closed within them were the eyes of the soul, what we would call today perhaps the rational mind. And when they ate of the forbidden tree, the eyes of this soul were opened, and immediately they responded. They responded differently in a new way because they responded out of an instantaneous need to preserve, protect themselves, and to provide for themselves. So when this change came upon them, what was it that was activated in them? It was, my friends, the soul, the eyes of the rational mind. And the response of the soul tells us how suddenly they saw this new reality. Before when God would come into the garden, his, pres his presence was welcomed, warm and refreshing. God was not someone to be feared. He was not the enemy. That, my friends, is when you are led by the Spirit. When the human, when the man, is in fellowship through his Spirit with the God, with the living God and the Spirit of the living God, God is not the enemy. The appearance of God is welcomed, always welcomed, to his children. But when the soul is ruling, the soul is in competition with the will of God. And so the soul sees God as an oppressor, as an enemy, as something to be feared. All the facts, my friends, in the garden were the same. Adam and Eve were still there. God still came into the garden. They were still naked. But this time, when the soul viewed reality, the soul saw fear and wanted to change its reality. So when God came into the garden and the Spirit saw God come, it was a time for fellowship and gladness always before. Yet, when the newly activated soul, soul saw God coming, the soul wanted to cover himself and hide. That tells us, my friends, that the soul sees things very differently from the spirit. Furthermore, as between God and man in the garden, nakedness was the norm and man was not vulnerable in his nakedness. He was naked. He was not ashamed. When man walks with God, God fellowships always with the man in the nakedness of intimacy. That is, there is nothing hidden from the eyes of the Lord. And the nakedness of man was a metaphor for the all-seeing vision of God and the fellowship that God would have with us. When he sees us stripped of iniquity through the blood of the living Lamb. Now when the soul sees, excuse me, now when the soul rules, Hiding yourself 
becomes very important indeed. You see, clothing also is a metaphor, a metaphor for disguise. When they heard the Lord coming for his time of intimacy with them, Adam and Eve now wanted to be seen differently. The way the soul sees itself is to present an image that it hopes will be accepted and believed by the person viewing it. And because of this new reality and this new desire, man began to hide from God while he saw that his own need was to provide for himself now. Man's nature, when he is not in fellowship with God, is to protect himself and to provide for himself. He is impulsively drawn to that, so much so that the enemy observes that man gives in always to these three basic impulses which supply him or which pretend to supply him with his need for provision and protection. These three basic impulses are the lust of the flesh, the cravings of a fallen nature, if you like, the lust of the eyes, the arrogance of your vision for life, and the resulting pride of life. And that these three things, when you look at them apart from, apart from the language, what are they in reality? They are an expression, my friends, of fear. They are an expression of the fall. For when you are trying to provide for yourself and protect yourself, you ask some very basic questions about everybody and everything outside of yourself. Who is my enemy? How might I prevail against him? And do I possess the necessary means? The lust of the flesh allows you to, to define others as your enemy because the lust of the flesh compels you to subjugate other people, to manipulate them, to control them in order to empower yourself over them. You think nothing of controlling others when you are ruled by the, less, the lust of the flesh. The cravings of the sinful nature because that's what it is. It's all about me. Me. Above all. Above everything. I will survive no matter who I have to step on. That's the craving of the sinful nature. The craving of the sinful nature establishes man as the only God he could possibly serve. And that's why Darwin's theory of evolution was so appealing across the board because it legitimized the killer ape within us, so to speak. The one who survived above all else. The survival of the fittest. The, the philosophy here, the philosophy within this that embraces the concept of the survival of the fittest, my friends, is the perfect framing, absolutely the perfect framing of the biblical notion of the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes is your vision for accomplishing your survival and your dominance. How might I prevail? What is my plan to survive over the opposition? The lust of the eyes is appropriately called the lust of the eyes because it speaks of your vision and of your plan. It's funny, we've thought, and the churches will tell you all of this for millennia, that this lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes have mainly to do with sexual lust, lusting after things, possessions as well. But this may be a part of the manifestation, manifestation here. But it is not a compendium of this description. It is much more a complete and sinister thing than that, my friends. What is my vision for surviving and thriving over those who oppose my existence in the station and form that I feel is appropriate? Whatever it takes, this is the natural response. And this is the depth of the lust of the eyes. And finally, the pride of life. The boasting about what he has and he does is the biblical description of this pride of life. Well, pride of life is, can I accomplish? 
Do I have within me the means that are necessary to accomplish my plan? And if not, how may I get them? The boasting about what you have done and what you can do. All of these are a part of the pride of life. Well, the world of Satan, the world that he offers, the control that he offers, gives you exactly that attraction. It offers you first a philosophical legitimacy of surviving above all else. It offers you secondarily a plan, a perspective on how you might accomplish this through manipulation, through control, and through his systems that further that. And finally, it offers you the hope and the promise that you have within you and within your reach and within your allied reaches through the hive that he provides the way of accomplishing this only if you will trust in the new realities of Satan's creation. You see my friends there is another world aside from that which God created. It is a world of systems and illusions meant to give man the appearance of control and this world is created and empowered by Satan and it was this world that John told us to flee do not love the world or the things of the world whoever loves the world the love of the Father is not in him clearly my friends he is speaking about a different world other than the geography or humanity or the life in God's creation. That's the important point. Furthermore, this world that John speaks about has a creator who is different from the Almighty because this world is different from the worlds that God made. In reference to physical creation, all life, all geography, all space and time, God is the Lord. He is creator. But in reference to the world's systems and control structures that Satan has put in place. He, my friends, is the master. And as he is the maker of this worldly system, then the meaning here of this term world could not be either a reference to humanity or to geography, but because both of these, as the world tells us, already have a maker. And that is the living God. So the world we were told not to love, you see, is a reference to something other than the creation we see around us. What is it a reference to? It is an alternative to God, my friends. An alternative to putting your trust in God. You can begin to see the operation of this new reality immediately after man sinned. Before man sinned, his needs were met and he was protected. His physical needs for food, for shelter, for clothing. All of these things, all of these things were met. And his need to be protected did not exist. He was naked and vulnerable. And he was neither afraid nor ashamed. The moment he sinned, though, what did he do? The moment he sinned, he clothed himself and he hid, did he not? Where did he get this idea to clothe himself and hide? And what was he afraid of? Why would he hide? You see, you hide because you are afraid. And you are afraid because you have offended someone that is more powerful than you. Moments before, it never entered their minds to hide or be afraid. Moments before, moments before they ate of the tree, they were naked and unconcerned. Why would they hide? Why would they clothe themselves? You see, my friends, clothing themselves and hiding are indications of very important, very important changes within their perception, within their mindsets, and how they viewed the world around them. Before they ate of the tree, they could see that it was free, pleasing to the eye. So they could see with their physical eyes before they ate of the tree, they were naked and unashamed. When God came into the garden, they were not afraid because they fellowship with God regularly. And in this arrangement, there was no need to provide for themselves. 
or to protect themselves. So you see, the eyes of their spirit were opened also. The eyes of the flesh, the eyes in their heads, could see the fruit on the tree and it was pleasing. The eyes of their spirits, fellowship with God. They had enlightenment and understandings, concepts associated with vision and seeing. What remained closed were the eyes of the soul. So God told them in essence, don't eat of the tree because if you do, the eyes of your soul will be opened and you will begin to make decisions that will cause you to stray. And because of that, you will surely die because you will be cut off with your source of life. You are the creatures and I am your creators. Only in fellowship with me can you maintain your existence. This, this is the crux of what God told them. And then Satan comes into the garden and he lies to them, convinces them that the eyes of their souls needed to be opened so they could begin to make all of the right decisions for themselves because the decisions they were making now simply were not right. They weren't in control of their lives and they would never reach the potential they were created for if they did not take that control. We all know the story. They gave in, they ate, their eyes were opened and immediately, my friends, immediately paranoia set in. You can infer this from the fact that they clothed themselves and hid. You can infer from that a fundamental change in their mental state had taken place. Prior to that, God came into the garden and they were not afraid. Prior to that, they showed up to meet and walk with God. The difference was made when the eyes of their souls were opened because something was in, unlocked in the human being that now caused him to view everything, absolutely everything, differently. And this, my friends, you see, is the thing that Satan exploits. He exploits the desire of humans to survive in this world. He subverts how they plan for their own survival. And he subverts their understanding of their resources. The resources necessary to survive. These three things, known variously in the scriptures, as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In short, if you find yourself playing God, then you are confronted with these three things. Number one, the need for survival. Number two, a plan for survival. And number three, gathering the necessary resources to meet that plan for survival. These are the three things that the natural man in his soul is occupied with. And they are so dominant that they are compared to and properly called lusts within the word of God. The desire to survive above all else. The vision that you bring your plan to accomplish your goal of surviving. And the third, the pride of life, what you do in order to accomplish these goals. How do you get there? What are your resources? These are the three things. The worldly structures and systems. The thing that Satan created. This is to be the way for human mind to be able to accomplish these three goals without needing to trust God. That's exactly what Satan's new reality is all about. And these things have been working their way through history, ever expanding, ever moving forward, until by the end of the age, and perhaps even now, they will control the existence of human life itself on a worldwide scale. Now what herds people into these systems and forces them to trust these systems? Initially, it is just supplying your need like sewing fig leaves together to protect yourself and cover yourself. Like hiding. These were the initial responses. But mankind, as his departure from God has expanded through the centuries and millennia of his rebellion, has become not only increasingly paranoid, 
but further and further distanced from God. And with more and more people on the planet, the need to supply each one personally took on the need for massive systems, systems of government, security, agriculture, military, industrial, transport, social control, communications, and religion, among many others, just to do it. And as life took on a momentum of its own, away from Eden and away from God, the need for these systems became more and more critical. And Satan, always there, always had these systems within his mind and on hand, ready to give. But man did not always see his need for a systematic approach. But as we became more intertwined, more numerous, these systems in the hands of those who serve Satan became the means of control, of manipulation, and of direction. Consider today our obsession with global security, the need to be secure. Is every individual capable of securing himself against the indiscriminate killings we saw on 9-11 and in the Boston? No. Those people in the Pentagon, the World Trade Center, and in Boston, and the victims of most terrorist attacks hardly knew what hit them. So they could not protect themselves. But now, looking in the aftermath of all of these things, looking at how to accomplish this individual protection, the nations of the world, the peoples of the world, have coalesced into these systems created by Satan by which this might be accomplished. And this is also being done across the board, my friends, in the field of food production, transport, communications, religion, etc., etc., on down the line. The point is that these systems are now, in these days, taking control of our lives, enslaving us, even taking control of the opportunity for life. And this is now happening around the globe at an absolutely amazing, even alarming pace. Now a system effectively looks at every aspect of a process, examining where that process is flawed and seeking to fix the holes in the process. That is why you see Satan's kingdom is systematic. It offers protection and provision on a global basis for whoever adheres to it. But the philosophical foundation of the whole thing is rooted in the trust in what you can do, what we can do for ourselves. Not only individually, but especially collectively within the hive that Satan will provide. That is why the world that he has created is systematic. It is not geographic. He is not the creator of the geography. Therefore, his, his kingdom would not necessarily be comprised of the geographic only. But to tell you the truth, my friends, quite frankly, he does not need to control the geography if he can control all of the systems that control life. Take a look at these systems as they are closing in on us. As we speak, we see them in their full fruition. The NSA scandal, listening in and collecting data on all of our private communications. The IRS scandal, punishing people for political views deemed inappropriate. Cameras are everywhere in our cities recording us constantly. Obamacare has passed not to give us health, but to control our access in order to control behavior. And even on a personal level, we can be tracked in our phones through GPS, and all of our personal information is shared across the world in databases, all meant to entice and control. The point is, my friends, that I'm trying to make with this, is you do not have to control the physical geography if you control everything upon which human life depends. And this is the plan 
as we come into these last days, as we see kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, and as we wait for the days that God told us about. These systems are meant to be complete renditions of what we see and of what we need. If you have a need to communicate and the system, com system of communication is globally linked, then you must give up your privacy, the privacy of your location, perhaps your identity, and perhaps the privacy of your message itself. You must give it up in order to participate and that is what these systems are all about. It's all about controlling people and that is why as we come down to these last days that is what this kingdom, this kingdom of Satan will be my friends. A kingdom of control, a kingdom of systems. There are many such systems now but as we see they are beginning to broaden and coalesce, incorporating others within them. And this will continue, and it will coalesce their systems of control into seven integrated systems, eventually. And these seven systems, my friends, will be ruled over by ten kings, and one will arise up and rip out three by the roots. But that is a message for another day. But for now, as we look to this coming ahead of us, I hope you can readily see, clearly see, that the end of the age that we see ahead of us is the full compendium and summation of everything that began all those years ago in the garden. The truth is, my friends, the events of the garden are like the seed and the end of the age is the resulting crop in all its fullness. Amen. Until the next time, my friends, have a wonderful day in our risen Lord. Goodbye.